Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ali Oop Show. I'm Andrew Gaze, and joining me every week, well, this is our third week, and he's joined me every week so far, is the legend himself, Leonard Copeland. G'day, Copes. Troy, what's happening, brother? Good to be here, son. It is, and um, before we get stuck into the basketball stuff, right here on the go. top here of the show, this is the most important thing that's happened this past week, is you, my friend, had a holy one in golf. What an incredible achievement that was. And the best thing was you were there to see it because if I told you it happened and you weren't there, you wouldn't believe me, brother. Yep. You picked the club. No, that's true. You behind me and you, you yep. saw it all the way. Yep. Well, it's one of the greatest assists I think I've ever had because <laughs> uh, you walked up to the, the ninth of the beautiful Mount Derriman golf course and uh, very short par three. I'll talk people through it. It's about 110 metres. And you lined up and you had an eight on in your in your hand. I said, Copes, I think that's a little bit too much. And you were reluctant, but you went back to, back to the nine. And Copes, just, just relit it for me, will you? Well, not, I said nice, easy swing. I didn't <laughs> want to hit it hard. I just wanted to punch no. it through. I punched it through, Drew, and it was straight the whole way. <laughs> did, not, did not waver. No wind anywhere. Yes. Straight in the pin. Hit the yes. ground and rolled right in, and we went nuts. We jumped up. We did. Oh, we didn't social distancing, but we didn't. We didn't. We didn't social distance. We high fived. We hugged. Yes. Well, coach, I, I I mentioned it on social media, and I did get some feedback, and I've got some really disappointing news for you because a, apparently. If you get advice from your playing partner, if your playing partner tells you what to, to do or, well, or does something, it it's lost. a two-stroke penalty. So it the setback lost. is it's only a par. <laughs> that's, apparently, that's, apparently that's true. Now, I don't know, yeah. but uh, according to us, I still claim it as the only one. It was fantastic <laughs> to be there. Hey, Coach, it's uh, less than a week away from the NBA start tipping off. Exciting times. We've seen some... Uh, practice games that, that the teams have already had and really good the way in which they've set up the venues. It looks nice, doesn't it? It looks really nice. Uh, I was encouraged by the way the, the, some of the players look like they're in shape. They're really playing hard. I mean, they're, they're eager. Um, is that Manute Bowl's son? That yes. I started? Bowl Bowl or whatever his name is? Yes. Fucking shots, taking it to the hole, dunking and shooting threes. So, you know, it's going to be, I'm excited about it. I can't wait until the first game. Well, it certainly is. I'm, I think we're all very excited to get some uh, basketball back on the screens and um, still uh, being very alert and conscious of social distancing. We see the big plastic screens that are up over the score benches. There's big separation uh, with the players on the bench. They've got this special chair for for time out. So, so they're really going above and beyond in order to, to make sure at least from people watching it, that they're doing their absolutely the absolute best to obey the social distancing rules. I don't understand that, though. If they're all in the bubble together, yes. why do they need the social distance? I mean, just, just think about it. If you're all there anyway, you're training every day together, why do you need the social distance on the bench? Explain that to me, Mr. Mr. Well, I, I think that it's, it's twofold. Is okay. One is that... You can carry the virus without necessarily knowing that you, you're, you're sick, you can be asymptomatic, and uh, there could be ways in which through staff that through something untowards happen that's, that uh, someone gets contracts the virus and can be spread so easy. So one is to, to continue the health and safety of the players, but, but also I think it's all the, the public perception. It's the message that you're sending out uh, to, to the rest of the community to say, hey, this is really important and copes. it leads us to the next issue because we spoke last week about snitches and how in which there's this hotline that players can call to dob in those in the bubble. Yep. Well, Dwight Howard's one that uh, has been snitched on because... Twice. He's been snitched on twice. Twice because he hasn't had his mask on. So players around are saying, hang on, uh, you're supposed to have your mask on and uh, they've snitched on him. But um, uh, Doc Rivers took it to a next level because he saw the snitching rules. Did you see what he said? I saw it. Let's, let's call on let's snitch on LeBron and get him out of here. <laughs> he said, I'm going to snitch on LeBron. Pop, I'm just going to snitch on everyone. And try all, to of get rob all of his robberies, he wants him out of there. That's a smart move. <laughs> no, well, that's, tr that's true. And um, i tell you what, though, Coach, Dwight Howard, in my view, hasn't covered himself in glory. This is a very serious issue. Yep. He's, he's rebelling or, or certainly not 
adhering to all the rules and regulations in regards to wearing a mask. And then we see him come out in this uh, social media uh, video that he did proclaiming that he's anti-vaccination. Do I believe in vaccinations? No, I don't. That's my personal opinion, but no, I don't. Now, we're all entitled to our views, and we all, but when you're talking about science and logic and given the pandemic that we're going through right now, I, I thought that was really disappointing on his behalf. Man, that, that's his egos. These guys have these massive egos. They feel like they can, they can conquer the world, do whatever they want. Mm. I think he's an idiot. But, but, I, but look, on the other side, I'd like to say, why yep. do you need a mask if you're playing, you can't, you're not wearing a mask if you guys are playing and you're running up and down the floor. Mm. When, why do you need a mask if all the guys are in the same bubble? I know you said it's for the fans watching and you want to send the right message. But you, I, yes. I'm with White Howard when he says, if I'm going to play against you in 48 minutes, why do I need a mask walking around the hall when I'm standing next to you? Does not make sense? Yeah, but don't forget, Coach, in that bubble, you've also got people... Um, that are serving them, that are taking care of them. That are they all in the bubble? I thought that everyone's in the bubble. But there is still that element of doubt of airborne particles, all those things that can happen within the bubble that's quarantined to their absolute very best. Right. But you can't cover everything. So you, it's just that. And, and when you look at the United States and one of the, when we talk about uh, the issues that, these guys are facing, it hit home just uh, a couple of days ago when it was announced that our very own Aaron Baines has contracted the virus and by the sound of things, he's gone through some pretty tough times. Unfortunately, I tested positive for COVID uh, a while back now and, yeah, just in the NBA protocol trying to get, uh, trying to pass some steps to get reunited with the team out there in Orlando and, be part of the bubble. Yeah, since being first uh, found to be positive, uh, you know, the results take a little while. But, um, yeah, after that that first test came back showing positive, I went into isolation um, from everyone. You know, I was at the house, but I was isolated in a separate part of it, in a room, stayed, stayed away. The wife would drop off food for me, and we were doing our best. Um, you know, those first couple nights when I was isolated by myself, uh, that, that was the scariest moment for me because I also was putting my family at risk at that point. And they, they were exposed to it at a later point. Um, so they didn't all get, they didn't get it at the same time as me, but they, they were also positive, uh, at a later point. And we're not sure exactly just because of the delay and how long some of those tests take. Uh, you know, the, the biggest positive to come out of it was that I was the worst affected. So. Um, you know, they all had very minimal uh, symptoms, whereas it actually put me on my butt for a good week. You know, I slept for four days straight. There was one point where I didn't see back-to-back hours until after four days of being in bed asleep. And, you know, I was lucky that it didn't really get beyond that. My family is all testing negative now, but I'm still not. So I'm in that protocol where I have the antibodies that we've tested. I have antibodies. so I'm not contagious, but I still need those negatives because end of the day, that, that's the criteria the NBA set up. I'm contained within the four walls of my house, but I'm doing everything I can on a daily basis to stay ready. And as soon as we get those two, neg- two negative tests, then they'll uh, get me on a plane and get out to Orlando as quickly as I can. As, as the NBA is putting out every single day, mask up, please. So there it is, Coach. He's been a bit crook and he's had some issues but he hasn't yet to be in the bubble as yet but he's looking to get back into it his kids that's when it really hits you when your whole family um get is contracted with it it's not just yourself it's the others and the impact that that can have on really scary time uh for him absolutely and and look like you said he's just he's got kids and when you got kids involved and your family's involved Mm. basketball means absolutely nothing and that's sort of what i said when we did the uh, the first show, family comes first, man. I, as much as I want to get out on that basketball court and I want to compete and I want to be there with my teammates, when you think you can harm your kids or harm your family, yeah, then there's something else to think about. Well, coach, we've spoken about how these players with the uh, 
the treatment that they're normally accustomed to, the way in which they're cared for and, and um, going into the bubble where some of those resources they they normally have aren't available, that perhaps that you can lose a bit of perspective. But it was from someone from our part of the world uh, that, that I think made a comment that really warmed the cock of my heart, and that's the big fella, Stephen Adams, when he gave us a really good perspective on what life is like and how we should be thinking of life in the bubble. Just overall, your thoughts on life inside the bubble right now. Uh, it's all good, mate. Um, let's, get, let's be clear, mate. This, this is not Syria, mate. You know what I mean? Like, it's not It's not that hard. It's not that difficult, mate. You know what I mean? It's, we're living in a bloody resort, you know. Everyone's got to complain. Everyone has their own preferences, mate, but, you know. It's not, it's not anything too serious. It's just a bit of a uh, bit of dry food here and there, and yeah, get bored every now and then. But yeah, it's all good, man. Smart, smart man. He, and what he says is true, Julie. These guys are complaining about their food. My bed's a bit too small. My my cover's not warm enough. Are you kidding me? Come on, guys. Come on, man. You're making millions and millions of dollars to do something everyone in the world would love to do, and mm. and. You're on TV and people are watching you. They're making you these superstars. Stop complaining. Mm. Let's get it done. It's not an easy situation. We don't want to uh, belittle it too much and say, well, they're just being prima donnas here. But, um, but yeah, I think Stephen Adams did a, a, a really good job of, of putting it into some more realistic perspective, which we can relate to. Hey, hey Copes, one of the big talking points, one of the big things that I'm looking forward to is, is Ben Simmons. Yep. And, and what he's going to be able to do with this uh, hiatus that they've gone through, how players have been working on their games. And we spoke about it last week when we thought and heard that he was going to be uh, spent, spending more time in the four spot. And uh, Brett Brown, the head coach of the Philadelphia 76ers, he went out of his way to talk up Ben Simmons and this transition that he's making and the work that he's doing with his jump shot. You know, you're just using him in a bunch of ways and you're seeing all the different ways that he can score. And uh, your point about shooting um, is is true. And I, I think just because of the variety of ways that we're trying to use him uh, helps in some capacity. And I think maybe m most helpful is his mentality. Like he's coming down here with just a tremendous spirit, like his, his three point shot, um, is looking good. You know, uh, he shot more threes in practice the last few days than he might've for almost half a season. And he looks good. He feels good. And I know he's getting tremendous encouragement, uh, from, uh, from his teammates. Copes, this is something that almost until the three point shot is resolved, is going to be talked about until such a time. Where he's going to be scrutinised, all eyes are going to be on him in regards to his three-point shot. He's so far in his career, two of 23, 8.7% from beyond the arc. But we've seen him getting some shots up and we're taking a look at, at his technique. As a elite shooter, I'll put you in that category, Copes, well, somewhat you. inconsistent from time to time, but an elite shooter, just... As you look at this three-point shooting technique, do you see any reason why he can't become a, a reliable three-point shooter or at least someone that can be a threat from the three-point line? Joey, yeah. Brett Brown's a smart man. We both know Brett knows the game. I'm not bagging Brett Brown. Nope. Let me say this. I'm going to yes. say to you. Mm. I want you before. I know it. Coach, break down the know, shot. You don't know what I'm going to say. All right. Before, <laughs> listen. There's some missing. The massive difference in shooting in practice and yes. knocking down threes in a game. We of both, course. Am I, are, we, are we in agreement with that? We are absolutely agreeing. Now, if I'm a coach mm -hmm. like I've been and you're a coach like you've been, mm. is Ben Simmons more valuable with the ball in his hand, distributing to guys like Tobias Harris and Shane mm -hmm. Milton from the three-point line? Because when he's coming down that court – the players drop. Yeah. He kicks it out. They knock down their threes because they're well-known three-point shooters. Mm -hmm. Is he a better threat in the four spot 
with the ball outside shooting threes. You tell me. Well, right now, with the evidence that we've seen, he's been elite as a point guard. The way in which he can distribute the ball, create for others, um, his basketball IQ is off the charts. Uh, he's an exceptional talent, a very rare breed. But I think that the the versatility that they're going to be introducing with him, I don't think that for a minute that he's just going to be exclusively, well, we're just going to put him on the box and, and have him play there. He's going, to, he's going to be mixing it up. But whether you're in the four spot, the point guard, whatever spot he plays, until such a time as he demonstrates that he can shoot a three. And I get back to my original question. With that three ball, with his technique, do you think it is... Um, that broken or that unorthodox that he won't be able to become a threat. I think the technique is improving and I think he can become a, a good three-point shooter. And with Brett Brown's comments, the most thing that sticks out to me the most and resonates as far as solving that problem is what's happening mentally with Ben Simmons and how he is going to approach it mentally as, as well as doing the work and constructing his, his technique. Because we played the game. Me and you have played the game. For yes. Hundreds of games we played. Hundreds. Yes. You can't change your mentality in one summer. No. His game is to get that ball off the glass and push it as fast yes. as you can. And I'll say it again. Not to come down the court, set up, and shoot a three-pointer. So I don't care what kind of technique he's working on, <laughs> how much faith. <laughs> Praise they've given him in practice. Yes. Ben Simmons is not a three-point shooter, and he's not ever going to be a three-point shooter. And yes. Philip knows that. They wouldn't have given him $200 million if <laughs> they didn't know that. All I'm saying is, Ben, yeah. stick what you're doing. I don't think you have to be a three-point shooter to be successful. You just keep doing what you're doing. Maybe you, you got to develop a better shot from outside. Mm -hmm. but don't sit there and change your game for anybody because what you do right now is exceptional. I actually think that he can develop what he's got to where he can become a big enough threat. But, Copes, whether you say it, I say it, all the experts say exactly what uh, you're expressing, the reality of it is you go on and you look what the fans are crying out for and they want to see him be able to, to shoot the three ball. That's just life. That's, that's how question. it is. Let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. So he goes out there and he goes 0 for 5 or 0 for 6 in a game or 1 for 7 from yep. the four line. I know Philadelphia fans, they will boo him out of that stadium. No, I, I think that he's got this period that he can go through. I reckon the next 18 months to two years, as long as they see him him working on it. Right now, they're booing him out of the stadium for not even looking, for giving up three balls. They, 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 are, they are on him for, for, for not trying to improve that area of his game. But he is trying to improve. And obviously, you see the results in his free throw shooting. I think the, the season before this one, he was in the, the 50s. I think before we went into the um, lockdown and, and the league was stopped, he was up around the 70s with his free throw shooting. So he is working in it and it takes a pound of work. There is no secret to becoming a great shooter other than a pound of work, but he seems like he's, he's, um, he's embracing it and he's getting better at it. I love Ben Simmons. Ben Simmons, keep doing what you're doing, brother. Yes, uh, oh, here, here. I agree with that. Hey, Copes, um, while we're talking about Ben Simmons, it, it got me thinking, and it's something that in this uh, down period with all the questions that have been asked on, on social media in regards to Australian players in the NBA, he's only been in the NBA a very, very short period of time. What is it? This is his third season um, because he set out his, his yeah. rookie season. Is he already the greatest Australian player ever to play in the NBA? Now, that's a big, big call, an early call, and I'm not sure we can put him in that category yet. I think he will get there. But some are suggesting that even right now in these early stages with what he's been able to do, almost averaging a triple-double uh, across those uh, three seasons so far, do you think he's the greatest ever Australian player to Play in the NBA? I think Ben Simmons will be the best player yes. to play in the NBA. Right now, I'm going with Luke Longley because he has championship ring. <laughs> the bottom yes. line, you play for the ring over there. That's that's the saying in America. Because yes. everyone makes the money. Everybody's got money over there. Every NBA player makes money. So what are you playing for? We're playing for the ring. 
Yes. And when you walk out of that, walk out that court, and you got a championship ring on your finger, then then you got you got nothing to say. Well, if you're going to use that, he hasn't got as many, but Paddy Mills has got an NBA ring and played a very significant role in NBA championships. You've also, and for me, it surprises me a little to hear you say that because, yes, winning a ring is is the ultimate. But if you look at someone like Charles Barkley, a good friend of yours, he never won any rings, and I think we'd still have him in the conversation of those top all-time greatest players. Yeah, we, exactly. But you were talking about Australia right now, and the best to come out of Australia yes. right now. Yes. Right now, I'm giving it to Luke Longley. In 10 years, come back. Ben Simmons will probably be the best player to ever come out of Australia because of what he can do. Again, he yeah. has to work on that jump shot. Yes. But look, why, he has to win a ring before you put him in that category. Well, that's going to be hard. And, and I disagree with you to say, well, if he doesn't win a ring, then he can't go down as the greatest Australian player to play in the NBA. I wow. don't agree. Wow. I don't agree with that, Coach, because the, you can be – I've won a ring, and I am so far from being in the – I was sitting in a suit on the sideline during the championship I'm sorry, series. All I'm saying is, so so we're going to sit there and count his stats, which is great. Everyone everyone has stats. But well, you gotta, you got to include all that, all, all course, the different things in the criteria. You include them all, and a ring is part of it. you got to include a ring as well. Yes. No, oh. and I like the fact that you pay homage to – You had a ring, with. but you had no stats. No. Ben's got stats, but he's got no ring. Luke Longley has a ring and stats, bro. <laughs> that is true. I had zero stats. I had stats for, for hitting blokes on the tush and saying, come on, and waving a flag. I was off the charts. In, in the, the, unfortunately, they don't stat those stats. But they're very important as part of putting together a championship 100%, team. 100%. 100%. Hey, uh, Cubs, let's turn our attention to the goings-on in the NBL. It's an exciting time and because we free agency start, we've got players signing. Um, and players are excited about They think the season's going to start in December. So everyone's getting a little bit excited about it. You know? they, they are. And I heard Vince Crivelli, the CEO of Melbourne United, because we know that the season's scheduled to start in the start of December. But I was always under the impression that, well, hang on, if... There's some circumstances here that prevents fans in particular coming into the venue, then we're not going to be able to start. Mm -hmm. But according to Vince Crivelli, all the owners have agreed, signed off on the fact that even if you can't have any uh, fans in the venue, they're going to start the season. Here's what Vince Crivelli had to say. The league and the owners are all committed to um, having the season irrespective of what the restrictions are, um, which is which is really positive news. Um, you know, we've built so much momentum as a league, as you know, over yeah. many, many years now that, um, you know, um, stopping it right now would make very little commercial sense. Um, the players want to play. Um, the fans still want to support the clubs. Our sponsors have been unbelievably um, loyal and, and terrific in sticking with us. And, and so, you know, the show goes on. Well, that's that's good news, and it comes as a bit of a surprise. Now, obviously, things can change. If you see the situation in Victoria as we speak, and something, uh, and, and they don't improve, then clearly the circumstances change. But I think it's good news, and does give clubs some level of certainty to say, well, you know what? If we have to go through a period where we're not going to have fans, we can still go ahead and play. My question to you is: Would the NBL consider moving to Queensland like most of these other uh, codes? Netball, AFL, um, you know, all these other codes are moving to Queensland because of no cases. Would yep. the NBL consider that? I don't think that they have the resources to do that, like uh, set up a hub like we see in the NBA. But if you're in a situation where you can travel from state to state and one of the restrictions is, well, you can't have big gatherings so you can't have fans, that is going to... I think that's the only criteria for which you say, well, well, maybe we can go ahead. Maybe we can go ahead and still play these games but have no fans. But trying to uproot everyone and put them in a hub, uh, unfortunately, and not too many sports can actually do that. True. I don't think that we can 
that NBL can afford to do that. That's where let's you hope, say. Let's hope it works out because this is a dangerous this is a dangerous game, and I'll tell you mm. why. Because if you get to December and you're not allowed to have fans in your stadiums, yes, and the pressure is on these owners to pay the bills. Yes, they got to dig deep in their pockets. They all, a lot of these owners yes. are complaining about bills today. You got to dig deep in your pocket to pay these players and to pay pay the staff and all this kind of stuff. The following year mm -hmm. is going to be horrendous because <laughs> then they're going. I'm telling you now because then they're going to go. Well, we 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 lost so much money. Mm. I'll see owners flying out the door. I can't afford this. I can't pay this. Salaries come down. That yep. well, no, you're spot on, and uh, it's a huge burden. And I think we undersell and don't laud the owners enough because even in good times, it's a big, big challenge for them to make ends meet. But the investment they make into this great game provide opportunities for the players so and the fans and the entire sport from grassroots all the way through the top. You need a real solid pyramid and they are at the top. And if it's not for the owners, and in particular Larry Kesselman, the owner of the entire competition, well, we don't have a league. or We certainly don't have a league that looks like it does now where it's high quality and played in great facilities. I got a question for you, and we probably, yes. we probably need to save this for next week because it's such a good question. All right, <laughs> cutting myself on the back here. Yes. Why doesn't the NBL have a TV deal? Netball has one. AFL has one. Tell why didn't the NBL have money coming in like these other codes? Well, it does have a deal. It has a very solid contract with um, uh, the, the different a deal. Well, not where it's generating. Uh, revenue for it. And that just comes down to what someone's willing to pay. And I think, though, in recent times with the, the way in which the game is taken to the people, the way in which it's been diversified through online and other, uh, the way in which you can consume the sport, it is generating a, a far greater value. So we are not yet at that stage like the AFL and NRL and, and even soccer it generates some significant revenue from television. We're not yet at that stage, but it is growing. And I think that uh, they, the, the television networks are investing in providing the space, allowing the content to be shown. The next step there is, of course, that, that you need to garner the audience in order, and it needs to be a big audience in order to um, to get that. But, but Cope, so I think it's, it's well and truly uh, heading in that direction and really good things are happening. Uh, now, now, Copes, getting back to free agency, and we're going to go through only a couple of the signings, but probably the biggest announcement uh, over the last couple of days is, through the free agency period is, is not someone that is signed, but someone who is not going to sign, and that is, of course, the great Damien Martin. One of the all-time great uh, players in the competition, renowned for what he does on the defensive end, been, a, been involved in, in, in championships, been a catalyst to those championships is, with the role that he's played. And the NBL, and full credit to him, have decided to name, and he'd only been retired half a day, and they said, your body of work is enough that we're going to name the Defensive Player of the Year after you. It's now going to be called the, the Damian Martin Defensive Player of the, the Year. Just give us your... Uh, Quick take on on Damian Martin and the player he is or was an absolute legend. This guy played injured, played played every time he got an opportunity. You saw him yes. diving for balls, um, stopping, getting the steal, doing all the little things that people didn't want to do. But yep. more important than that, he was the kind of guy that you could sit down on a bench with and talk to or sit in the locker room with yep. and talk to. So a great player on the floor, great defender on the floor, who developed a three-pointer as, mm. as, he, as he went on. Yes. But mm. a fa fantastic captain off the floor who helped his players win six championships. Yes, he's uh, – he's, we're going to miss him, that's for sure. Had the ability – and not many people, in fact, I can't think of too many, had the ability to make defence sexy. Now, that is hard. The way in which he went about it, you could clearly see what he was doing and the way he shaped the game on the defensive end. Now, there's been a lot of elite 
defenders, super elite defenders, that if you sort of had a casual interest in basketball and you went to a basketball game, you went away from it, you wouldn't be able to identify and go, gee, that bloke there, he really had an impact on the defensive end. Damien Martin was the sort of guy that even if you didn't know a whole lot about the game and you went and watched a game of basketball, you would come away from it and say he impacted the game and may not have scored a point or may not have even taken a shot. That was every game too, Julie. There wasn't a game I didn't watch with the Perth Wildcats that he didn't have some kind of impact. Yes. Be it defensively most, but like I said before, he developed a three-point shot because there were times when we played against him and people would say, oh, just don't worry about him. Yes. We'll, double, we'll double down on this guy. And he'd knock down that three in the corner and, and take you out. Yes. Well, Copes, we need to pay respect to you because a lot of people in this caper that we're now involved in are talking about the uh, their predictions and the way in which they want to be first breaking the news. Yep. Over a week ago... You came to me and said, Dang Adele is going to sign with the Illawarra Hawks. Now, I know you have the inside running because you know him personally, so you might have cheated a little bit. But we say, world under you, Copes. We uh, we ran with it on our program last week, and uh, you, you, you got that one right. But um, Dang Adele going to be a star in our competition. He's going to be a superstar in the competition because he does it all. He plays yeah. defense. He can shoot the three. He grabs that ball off the glass and he'll take it to coast to coast and he'll throw it down on you. Yes. A hell of a kid, man. I started with him when he was nine years old. Yes. In my little academy. And we started calling him Babyface. And <laughs> you see him growing and getting taller and handling the ball. He's been good for a very long time. Yes. I'm so proud of him and happy to see him back in the league. And I think he'll be an absolute superstar and he'll help the, the Hawks to, to, to make it uh, a better season. Well, Brian Gorge and the super coach, and uh, he is going to be very astute with the people that he brings in. And another one that he's bringing in is a former NBA player, played a couple of seasons with the Chicago Bulls, and that's Cam Bairstow. Coming off, a, he's had some significant injuries throughout the course of his career, but we played against him when he was uh, at the Brisbane Bullets. Great inside presence, runs the floor well, and if he is healthy, he's going to be another huge pickup for the Illawarra Hawks. He reminds me of Tony Bear, uh, the Bear. He, uh, Tony, Tony Ronson. Tony Ronson, yes. yes. Uh, big body, can score on any block, left hand mm. or right hand. And like you said, if he's healthy, him, Ding Ding Adele, Ding Ding, you put those guys on the floor with Brian Gordon as a coach, you're going to yes. be very competitive. And let's not forget uh, Sam Froling, who's, uh, I think, a, another guy that still very, very young in his uh, professional journey, but... But he be seven foot, he's certainly 6'10 very plus. Close, very close, very close. Pretty mobile up and down the floor. Not explosive hops, but with that sort of size. And Sam, with his uh, direction that he's going to get from Brian Gorgian, he could be a, another player that makes a huge step up from what he did last season with the Hawks. 100%. Do you, do you rate them this year? Do you think they'll make the playoffs? I think so. Well, anytime you've got Brian Gorgian in, in the conversation, Copes, let me repeat this. 19 seasons... In a row, Brian Gorge and coach teams into the playoffs. Well, you're I saying have... you're definitely going to make the playoffs. Are you saying that now live? No, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not because there's still a bit more work needs to be done with their roster before we get to that stage. But with Ding Adele, Cam Bairstow and what they've been able to put together, uh, they're going to be uh, – Sunday Dench is a, a huge loss for him because I think that he was showing great promise. And uh, to me, he was a real Brian Gorgian player with what he does on the defensive end. He's gone to the Adelaide 36s. The other one that um, we're familiar with and we we love him because he's a great man is Todd Blanchfield. He's signed with the Perth Wildcats. What do you make of that signing? Wow. I reckon Todd's one of those guys, if his confidence is high, mm. he'll knock down – Five threes in a row. Yes. I think being up in Perth with that massive crowd and having a cotton next to you. Yes. It's hard not to be confident. So uh, good luck to him. I, look, I wish Todd nothing but the best great guy off the court. One of mm -hmm. the best players, one of the best guys off the court I've ever coached. Uh, and, and, and talented, very talented. And we'll dunk on you too. Don't dunk. <laughs> oh, my word. You will dunk on you. My word, he would. Uh, the other one, the other couple that we want, just want to talk about quickly, uh, David Barlow. Yes. 37 years of age, I think he is. 
Two seasons ago, I think he had one of his best seasons ever in yeah. the NBL with the role that he played. Uh, still very good last season. But the season before that, before that, he was done. I thought he was – I said, there's no way Barlow's coming back. He had a great year. Yes. And, and still very powerful player, takes care of his body. He's been injured a lot, but he can shoot the ball as well. He is a – he makes the floor spread. And good on him for what he's been able to do, take care of his body and look after himself to a point where he's, I think it's his 17th, I heard someone say it was his 17th season as a pro. Had some tough injuries he had to deal with throughout the course of his journey as well. Played overseas for a few years. So he's had a tremendous career and uh, good luck to him. The other one, and I don't know how to say this, and I so I, I might butcher the name here, but the... Melbourne United, uh, they look like they're making a few changes. This Yude Baba is the Japanese player. Now, I can pl- I'm pretty sure I've completely butchered the pronunciation probably, of that name. Probably, yeah, probably. So we've got to we've got to fix that up. But he's one that, unlike it was with us when we had um, uh, Bo Lu, the Chinese player, we saw uh, Brisbane. They had a, a Japanese player on their roster that really they were there for other reasons. Uh, than just simply playing. Right. This guy here looks like I saw him a little bit at the World Championships, and, and he can play a little bit. He's another one that that versatile swingman, two three guy that can can do different things. He's going to be interesting to see as well. He is, but if he doesn't play any defense for Dean Vickerman, where where is he going to be? Gonna yeah, be yeah, he's, he won't be playing. No, but that's that's with everyone really uh, these days. Uh, the coach, he, he's he's there, and the other one that, that interests me, Ruben Tarangi. He's this guy that. Not last season, he, he he dropped right off. The season before, most improved player in the competition and became a reliable knockdown three-point shooter. Those numbers fell off a cliff last season. He they played- only fell off a cliff because Brisbane recruited over him. So don't, I don't think he lost anything. The year before that, he was a flat-out scoring machine mm-hmm. off the bench or whenever he played. Brisbane went and recruited over him. Brought in some guys. He didn't touch the floor. Now, the best thing to happen for him is to move on now and try to get his playing time back. Well, that's true. The thing is, I look at his entire body of work yeah. and you say, well, was that one season where he shot the heck out of it? Was that the anomaly? And he's really not as good as that. We know he clearly has got the capacity, but you know how you can just have sometimes those breakout seasons and it really is not necessarily going to reflect what you do. If, if, Simon Mitchell can get back to that with yep. Terang. Yep. If he can get to that point where he got that, that flat out knockdown shooter, he's a ball of energy on the defensive end. Yep. He can go in there with his athleticism and grab rebounds. He, he can be taught to play some decent defense. He has all the tool, tools and could be the pickup of the offseason. He's got size and he's big and strong as well. And he's but, big and strong as well. but that is a, I think the jury's still out. On him, yep. and we we um, we're certainly hoping nothing from the best uh, the best from him. Um, good, good. Hey, Copes, uh, as we do uh, each and every week, we try to reflect back on some of the magic moments. Now we've been talking about some of our magic moments, but a good friend of ours, Mark Radke, is a living legend, one of the all-time greats of the NBL, and in my view, the greatest rebounder Australia has ever produced. He's a superstar of um, uh, Australian basketball, four-time Olympian, uh, averaged over 11 and a half rebounds a game, and we had the good fortune to catch up with him earlier on this week. Well, Clopes, we're, uh, what a privilege it is today to be joined by one of the superstars of Australian basketball and also one of our very, very closest friends in the legendary Mark Bradkey. His, his resume is so long that we just don't want to waste time because he's a very important man, Copes, and he's got a lot of things on his plate. You can see where he's at right now at the uh, Moorabbin Indoor Sports Facility. I'm sure I'm not sure I got that name right, but, uh, Hoax, thanks very much for joining us. Hey, thanks, Drewy. Copes here. Now, you got the name right, so, uh, yeah, extremely busy. I've got my work clothes on today, so, um, yeah, been doing a bit of demolition work during the, uh, the lockdown. You had a video up the other day, Hoagie, with you working out on that machine. You look like you look like you're in pretty good shape. You were shooting threes, or you were shooting something close to threes. 
Well, yeah, no, I thought I'd put it out there more just I saw the NBL free agency was uh, re-signing <laughs> at the moment. So I thought if somebody wanted a uh, very slow, non-athletic, non-defensive play, um, just a person who's going to jack the ball up from the three-point line, then that I'm perfect. Uh, I wouldn't do any running. So, um, yeah, no, it was just uh, a chance. Uh, I borrowed a machine off a, a mate of mine. So uh, my young son's uh, getting plenty of shots up now. He's uh, This is his backyard. So uh, what we normally use is a, is a, a soccer futsal court is now being uh, purely basketball for him. Well, Hugs, uh, that little breakdown of your current skills, it pretty closely fits what I was able to do throughout my entire career. So it's uh, there, there may, be a, may be someone still out there looking for that. You need to knock them down, and though. Jury, hey, that Hose, was Julie every time. That was Julie every time. <laughs> Hose, we've got a bunch of things that we want to talk to you about, and we know your time is uh, a little limited here today. But uh, in our podcast that we're starting, we've touched on some, some memorable moments, and uh, we spoke about Coach when he hit that game winner, which you were very much a part of when we beat the Southeast Melbourne Magic. Uh, And then for me, it was the Olympics last week. I spoke about being involved in the opening ceremony and uh, being awarded the captain. In fact, you featured prominently in in my one because you were there when, by my side, when John Coates first told us it was a a great moment. But for you, the thing that sticks out, I don't know if it's your magic moment, but one of the biggest plays, biggest moments that I remember playing alongside you was actually with the Australian team when we were playing Italy in that 2000 Olympic Games. Uh, I can't remember exactly how long there was to go, but um, I think we might have been two points down and you had a couple of free throws. And without a doubt, the biggest free throws I can remember in a game that I've ever played in that uh, meant so much. Do you remember those free throws? And was it something that you think as a a highlight moment for yourself? I think you um, I think you have more um, um, passion or understanding because you probably thought I wasn't going to make it. Oh, I wasn't I'm sure I was a lot of people it. thought that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think, I don't know the stage of the game, um, but, yeah, but when they called a timeout to try and freeze the game up a bit, yes. um, yeah, I remember, see, I remember seeing you there very nervous. And, uh, and very <laughs> concerned about who was going to be taking the foul shots. But um, I just thought good thoughts, um, just stand up there, shoot the shot, and um, luckily enough, they did go in. So um, that was, um, yeah, it was, it was a very important, very significant you know, moment in, in, uh, of all the games that I've played. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, obviously being in Australia as well and uh, a lot riding on it. So well, there, were, there were big foul shots, but um, I had complete faith. No, well, I'm a oh, 57% Be honest, Hogan. Did you shit yourself? Be honest, Hogan. <laughs> nah. You know Never. it. You know it. Never. I did. How many times did I have to go up to Copes and flick the little bad man off his yes, shoulder? Because yes, he's always thinking thoughts yes. at the foul line. You go no. there and you hit him and say, all right, just knock these in. It's like when you go to, uh, when you're playing golf, we play a bit of golf now. If yep. you go to a par three that has water everywhere, mm. if you go and pick out the worst ball in your bag, Yep. You, you, you're, you're admitting defeat already. All right? Mm-hmm. So you go and get the best ball, you step up, you hit it onto the green, and you two putt or you one putt or whatever you can do from there. That's so the man with the You've got to you, you step up there, but you've got to step up there and believe it. Didn't mean they're going in, but well, you have to believe it. Well, Hugs, that, you're, you're under, so if you don't make those free throws, I don't think we win that game and we don't get to play for, for a medal. Um, so they were, they were huge. And I can, the thing that I remember the most in that time out and because we're close and we played together, for me it was like I was thinking, geez, I wish it was me because for the, for, I think if you, if you don't make these, I was worried about the impact it was going to have on you. <laughs> and I was thinking, well, I know I can deal with it. If I miss it, you know, I know. I, and I'm not sort of being big-headed or confident about it. It was just more a caring factor because of the consequences that were, were at stake. And Hugs, talk about your pathway because it's a little bit different in that you were somewhat of a late starter to the game. And, I mean, an unbelievable career, but these days you look at the prodigies that come through from about the time they're nine or ten and they've identified pretty early. That wasn't the case for you? No, not at all. I was a golfer. I was uh, playing golf. A golfer? Gymnastics. <laughs> that uh, that golf explains it. Gymnastics. So, uh, you know, that's where I got my grounding. I actually went to gymnastics camp one time, believe it or not. <laughs> that was the worst thing ever. <laughs> gymnastics but, no, camp? I was, uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> I think my parents wanted me out of here. So I had to go to gymnastics camp. And those bars, those parallel bars in oh. your arms killed me. I hated it. So, um, but uh, no, I was a, uh, I was a footy uh, AFL player. For, um, and then mm-hmm. when we moved to Queensland, there wasn't enough uh, players back in the, in the 80s. So I, um, I stopped playing footy. I used to windsurf and skateboard. So that was my, my chosen sport. But I actually watched the 1984 Olympics on TV. Yep. And I was about six foot nine at the stage. And I'd never seen basketball before. So I thought this sport looks pretty good. I'll give it a try. So I tried. Uh, I played the summer of uh, 84 at school mm. in Queensland. Moved back to Adelaide in 85. Um, started playing. Um, uh, I, tried, I had one practice going for North Adelaide in the uh, SANFL in the under 17s, under 18s, or whatever it was. Uh, but tried basketball the same day. And I liked basketball more. And three years later, I made the Olympic team. So wow. it was a very quick, rapid rise from not knowing much about the sport. But also, I think that helped in some ways because you didn't know the magnitude of the situation. You're like, oh, this is what everyone does. You play mm, a sport yeah. and you play and you, and you get better and away you go. So I was sort of lucky that um, I found a sport that sort of fitted my athletic abilities. Mm. Now, Hoagie, you, you got a, speaking of your career, you got a chance to go play NBA basketball over in Philadelphia. Is there anything, yep. can you, you got any funny stories about the playing with the 76ers? Well, I just seem that I seem to follow you all the time. So you uh, you play for the 76ers, and then you played in Adelaide, you played for the Tigers, you played in Brisbane. So you followed me everywhere. But um, uh, 76ers, that was a uh, – we had an interesting bunch of uh, characters. We had Alan Iverson and Derek Coleman as our two uh, – and Jerry Stackhouse. So we had three big personalities on the team and a coach that wasn't quite as powerful and as strong – as their personality. So uh, a pretty Who was the coach, coach? Who was the coach? Johnny Davis. Yep. Johnny Davis yep. was our coach, yep. who was a um, um, uh, a Hall of Famer nearly for the Atlanta Hawks, so a great yes, player. I know Johnny Davis but just well. didn't quite have the um, the authority over Allen Iverson. So uh, a great player. Um, uh, but we just didn't we, – we won 16 games. We were pretty disorganised and a lot of the assistant coaches would sort of come past and say, look, this is not a normal NBA team. You know, I understand that there's a different – different. Uh, um, uh, it's a different dynamic here. So um, it was uh, interesting times. I uh, didn't play too many games. Uh, played a lot in some games and then we'd go seven or eight games in a row without playing and so your emotions are up and down. Um yeah, so I actually didn't even try to go back. I was like, you know, I'd rather start, come back, play with your mates, and um, sort of have uh, more of an impact on the game. Oh, it was when you, I was there. I, I came and went and visited you, and I went to a couple of practice sessions and watched you guys working out. And it looked at like a really uncomfortable situation between the coach and the player. And you talk about the coach perhaps not having the authority, but how much authority can a coach really have. I mean, Alan Iverson looked like he was he was almost rebelling, it, it seemed. It was uncomfortable sitting there watching it. For you as a player, did anyone grab Alan Iverson, try to grab Alan Iverson and just say, hey, mate, this is this is not helpful the way you're behaving? Uh, you know what? I don't blame Iverson at all for the situation. Could mm. you hear you had a, a – you've watched his latest documentary about his uh, time in prison. So you yeah. have a young kid whose mother was 15 when she had him. And I think there was two or three of them in the house. You know, they had no money. They didn't have heating. Um, so you come into a situation where he was he was testing the boundaries and he, he couldn't find any boundaries. There wasn't a, a veteran leader on the team, which you see in a lot of NBA teams now or, or general sporting teams to try and show him the way. So he was a young kid who was given a lot of money and a lot of power who was just trying to find his boundaries. So we go on the plane and we go to take off. And he'd take his seatbelt off and run up and down the aisle. Mm. But no one would say anything. And so then you could see him sort of pushing it. So I blame the environment, not him. So it's always hard when you're a first-year coach and uh, you're new to the situation. So uh, the coach was trying to find his way. I was trying to find his way. Uh, Derek Coleman was a, a, another different personality. Um in, uh, generally, when you get them by themselves, really good people. But yep. in that environment, you start losing, you're not making the extra pass, maybe you're not coming to training quite as, as, as enthusiastic as you should. Um, and it, it builds and builds and builds. And Philadelphia is a tough town. You know, Brett Brown's been there for a long time, coaching has been there, obviously Ben Simmons. It is their blue collar. 
And mm. if you don't work hard, they would do us in the warm up sometimes. Mm. You know, if you weren't working hard in the warm up, they were getting on you. So and they'll put they you on the pr- front page of the newspaper when you're not winning. <laughs> Believe, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Believe that. Yeah, yeah. So they, if, if you worked hard, they didn't mind if you lost the Philadelphia crowd, but as long as you worked hard, because they're working mm. hard and they want you to work hard. So, um, like I said, so I blame the environment for the situation that was. You know, you know, looking at it now and seeing the way that the, the NBA or, or professional teams run, you have to have a strong personality as a coach. You have to be a leader. You have to be a disciplinarian, but you have to understand. So uh, that's why the great coaches stay around for a long, long time, and the ones who don't have one of those aspects find it hard. Hey, Hogs, let's uh, talk about your, your NBL career because it was a, an amazing career. Uh, but you started off with the Adelaide 36ers as a very young man with the big mullet, and we've got a little bit of vision of that running around as well. Have a look at my man there, just uh, lovely locks flowing. Uh, you were a very much a, a free spirit back in those days, I, I suspect, but uh, you played alongside a couple of legends as well, and, and I always hear you talk about Mark Davis and, and how important he was to your career as well. I wouldn't say I was a free spirit, but no, I had some uh, <laughs> great people. If you talked about what Alan Iverson was doing, it well, when I came to Adelaide 36ers, we had Al Green and Mark Davis uh, oh. as uh, the, the the dominant people at practice, alongside people like Mike McKay and um, yeah, Scotty Ninnis was there. We had a, a lot of people, but Mark Davis, I don't. I was there for four years. He didn't yep. call one foul ever. <laughs> Beat the crap out of me every single day, every single day. So as you come in there as an 18 year old. He never did anything wrong. He would travel. The coach wouldn't say shit. Don Shipway wouldn't say shit. He would take <laughs> 10 steps, score any failure, and then, yeah, yeah, good work. So that was the best grounding for me ever because yeah. all of a sudden you come to game time and they blow a whistle. You're like, I don't think I traveled. And they're like, no, they caught a foul against the other. And we're like, really? Yeah. You see what happens yeah. at training? That was nothing. So our training sessions were awesome. We had some sessions, and uh, I really enjoyed the, the 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 battles that came on there because, uh, like I said, Mark Davis, he didn't give me one thing, and that was probably the best thing that I could have asked for because um, uh, no, nothing was given. You had to go and take every single thing, and um, they, they, were, they were great times. I really enjoyed my time in Adelaide. And uh, it was a battle, and that was the, the 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 ground that started, and it just went from there. And how is it that a lot of speculation, rumor about what it was in regards to that transition? Because from Adelaide to Melbourne, and a lot of people in Adelaide, I can't believe how long their memories were. Because from then on out, didn't matter where you were. Whenever you went back to Adelaide, they still remembered and they, they kept booing you. Yeah, no, I actually went back last year and uh, got booed. I did a uh, fourth <laughs> lunch and got booed when I walked in there. And that most of them from my old teammates. So um, that was always nice. But, uh, yeah, long memories, which is good because uh, it means that you must have did something right when you were there and obviously yeah. pissed them off. But when uh, when the word came out that you're going to only take half your salary <laughs> and I can pick up a million dollars to come to the uh, That's uh, Melbourne what it was. Tigers, That's what uh, it was. Uh, I said it was all about the money. No, it was just a situation. I felt that I needed a change. Um, uh, I had my best game in Adelaide before I left. I had uh, We played Geelong yep. uh, with uh, Cecil Lexham, Dante's father. So I had a lazy 43 and 25 in that game as my last game for the Sixers. So maybe that stuck in their mind a little bit. Um, uh, but then I went, I, I played in Spain for a bit. And then when I came back, I thought it was a time to make a change. And um, it's just what happened. You know, people make moves. What do you think your best highlight of your career is? I mean, if you had to look back at your whole career, what's, what's the best highlight? Oh, shit, I wouldn't even know. So long ago, Coates. Um, I've got a really poor memory. I'll tell you what, when I played in Brisbane, uh, Stephen Black was on our team. Yep. Stephen yep. Black had the best memory of anybody ever. <laughs> so sometimes on the bus, we'd be going somewhere, and he'd be telling about games that I'm a part of. And I'd be sitting there thinking, all right, what happened next? <laughs> I have the worst memory. And I'm like, tell me more. Tell me more what happened. So I remember nothing. Um, mm. uh, there's a, uh, You know what the best, the best moments are? Uh, are times away from the court. It's... Um, Leonard Copeland banging on my door in Sydney in the middle of the night and I look through the little peephole and he's got all this money and he's laughing yep. and he throws it at me and he picks up and goes to the next door and bangs on the door again. 
Yeah. It's, 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 put it this way, Lennard played cards behind some American at the, at the Sydney <laughs> Casino and he yeah, won all the money. Yeah. So Copes had, Co- Copes had no talent. He no. just copied something else. <laughs> That's funny. It's, it's, um, it's playing dominoes with you guys and Drewy not counting up to and multiples of five quick enough and you taking your finger off the domino and Copes yelling out, you dumb mother, um, I'm taking your points. Yes. Wow. It's um, uh, it's at Sydney Olympics when I um, when we finished up uh, and uh, I think it was Hammer, Matty yeah. Nilsson who was in the squad, um, Wayne Peterson. We all got on a train and went down to um, Circular Quay to watch mm. the closing ceremony. You know, they were the more moments that I remember most of all just yeah. being with – so it's got nothing to do with games. You know, it was great to play, but it's, you know – Stopovers in airports where you're sitting there for eight hours and you're bored out of your brain. Um, it's stupid things that happen. They're, they're, they're my most fond memories. Wow. Nice. Uh, well, you, you, you were able to pick up three titles along the way. Uh, <laughs> with the, yeah, that's your title a little bit. <laughs> coupled with the Melbourne Tigers and, of course, the, the one with the uh, the Brisbane Bullets. Do, do you differentiate between those two? Are, are they things that you look back on and go, geez, you know, we weren't too bad? Yeah, we weren't too bad. Um, <laughs> with uh, obviously the first one was very significant, you know, uh, for all of us to get our first championship. That was a great one. The second one, when we were down and out, I think we were three and nine. Correct. And we won sixteen out of our last seventeen games. Yep. yep. And then the last one in Brisbane, we won twenty three out of twenty four games to finish off wow. the season. So there's one common thread there. I can't quite work out what it is. Oh, that's what I was a part of them all. Um, no. <laughs> and that, that MVP season in 2002, do you reckon that was, although you won the MVP and absolutely deserved it, in your judgment, was that your best season? Well, I had a lot more shots. <laughs> I had a lot more shots being able to put up. I don't know why. Why, why is that? Why is that? <laughs> we were giving you the ball. No, you were rigid. You go, you, you go were sitting down, down <laughs> Drew. Don't you remember that? <laughs> so all of a sudden, the ball actually got passed one more time. Oh, so yeah, rather than go. just gaze to Copeland and Copeland to gaze, I had to go one more pass. <laughs> so, um, oh, look, uh, yeah, I, I think I played all right that year. Yeah. So uh, I got a few shots up and uh, made a few. Um, and one of the all time great, re- I reckon you're the greatest rebound of the, the games ever seen. It's not always as sexy a stat as some of the other things that get the recognition for it. But uh, over the course of your career, 11.3, according to the stats that I have in front of me, was your your career average, which is incredible. Is it something that you acquired or was this an innate skill? Because teaching rebounding, yeah, it's effort and effort's a big part of it, but the actual skill of rebounding, I certainly found in the coaching caper, it's very hard to teach. Drew, I think I think the yeah. plays a role in it yeah. as well. You, you of course, big. but there's a lot of big blokes that don't get 11 and a half rebounds yeah, yeah, a game. I'm not, I'm not downplaying it. I'm just saying yeah. he's, he was the biggest guy on the court. He didn't get rebounds. We were going to sit his ass down. It's just the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, am I still on? Yeah, you're on. Working? Okay, yeah, you're now you're on. on. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I coach was on his rant. That's all. <laughs> um, no, I, I don't think there's any talent at all to rebounding. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, Mark Davis obviously instilled that into me. Um, uh, it's a chance to get touch the ball. So mm. offensively, if you get the shot, if you get the rebound, put the shot up. And I didn't want to play defense for too long. So if you got the defensive rebound, we're <laughs> off to the races. So yeah. it was simple as that. And uh, you can be a little bit selfish, I think, with rebounding because you want to get the ball to get our team to have another chance and uh, an opportunity. So I wanted to get 16 rebounds a game. That was always my goal. And people say 16 rebounds. Well, that's stupid. You can't get 16 rebounds. Well, I was thinking, well, it's a fair chance Lindsay's not subbing me out, so I'm playing a fair <laughs> bit of time. We've got four quarters. So if I can get four rebounds per quarter, and if one of those is offensively, so even if I miss my own shot, I get it back up. There's my one rebound on offense. So then I just need three defensive rebounds. It's going to be one or two foul shots. I'll get a, a rebound from there. So if you break it down really small increments, it's a pretty easy challenge. So it was pretty easy to really say, well, just go and get the rebounds. It's there. Push them out of the way. I, I, I enjoy the physical side of things. I wanted to try and push people around. I like to wrestle. I like to try and beat people up and down the court. And I like the mind game. So I like to try and, you know, intimidate people, you know, 
not, I wasn't a greatest trash talker, but I tried to sort of hit them a bit and let them know if they come in the key again, I'm going to smack them again. And that was part of the fun. Just quickly, talk about your Australian team experiences and, and what they meant to you. Uh, well, obviously, being a part of a team for such a long time, um, my first Olympics back in 88 through to 2000. So there was a core group. You were obviously a part of it. Andrew Vlahov, uh, Luke Longley, Shane Hill. Um, we spent a lot of time together. A, a, it was um, it was family. Mm. I think family probably sums it up best. Um, you know, going away on trips for, you know, four, five, six weeks at a time through Europe, we never got an itinerary. Mm. We didn't know where we were going. We yeah. just got told when we're leaving and roughly when we're coming back. And we didn't know where the games were, no mobile phones. It was great. It was really nice. We never, there was never a dietary uh, plan set up, I don't think. Um, <laughs> that were the best times. And, you know, and we really bonded. I used to hate Southeast Melbourne magic with yeah. a passion. John Dodge, Tony Ronaldson, biggest pain of the next you ever meet. They were my roommates all the time. Yeah. Best people on the, <laughs> once they're on your teammates, best people going around. I'll tell you one thing, with, um, with the Boomers, Brian Gorgian came in as a guest coach one time. So we're staying at the, the COE, the Institute of Sport. And I was a little bit late coming in to breakfast. We had one long table. There was one seat left alongside Gorgian. So I walked up and down twice, just <laughs> wait, had my tray in my hands, walking up and down. So I was like, man, I hate Gorgian. And there's only one seat. I can't sit on the table with the, uh, with the gymnast. So I was like, all right, I think I sit alongside of him. So I sat down and I looked the other way for a while and eventually started talking to him. You know what? Good guy. Great really guy. nice guy. Great guy. And, <laughs> but but so, so the boomers did that for you. You know, you hated them, but as soon as they're on your team, you do anything for them. What is it like now with the boomers? Because you were with the boomers the last couple of years and you went to the World Cup, heartbreaking World Cup. Has, has it changed significantly from when you were a player? Uh, yes, really has. Um, but everything evolves. But mm. the the one thing that still drives everybody is the trying to get that medal. Everybody has the same goal. Um, it's all about mateship. You know, uh, I'm, I'm not a very smart basketballer, but I got told a long time ago that on their coat of arms, there's, only, there's two animals. There's a kangaroo and an emu. And they're the only two animals in the world that can't walk backwards. <laughs> so we don't take a backward step. I love it. And so no matter what team you see, no matter where you go, so whether you're talking about back in 1988 with Brad Dalton and Wayne Carroll yep. or through to now with Andrew Bogut and Joe Ingalls, yep. everybody has the same attitude that when you play for Australia, we're a small country, we're fighting above our weight, that never changes. Before we let you go, quick question, how's your body holding up? Are you, are you healthy? Any injuries? I am crap. Um, I, uh, when I stopped playing, I got pretty bad rheumatoid arthritis. So I take medication every day now. So that hurts a lot. Uh, October, 2019, I had a total knee replacement on my left knee. So I only missed six weeks of golf. So I came back and started winning from you guys very early. I did take a car for the first few weeks, but having a plastic knee, uh, and a wooden leg now. I'm still getting the wind there. Back surfing. Uh, so, no, um, as you would both know, uh, getting up in the mornings, ankles don't work, back doesn't work. Um, but it's a good excuse not to do anything. So I enjoy um, uh, laying on the couch, um, eating too much food, um, things like that. But uh, I got a couple of shots up the other day, which was nice. You get that feeling. You think, oh, I'm only feeling 38 now rather than 50-something. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that uh, we had our career at the time uh, that we did. But, uh, yeah, there's no more running up and down for me. Well, you're a superstar, my friend, and uh, it's been a delight just to reminisce. We could go on and bang on here for hours, but unfortunately you've put a very, very strict time restriction on us and uh, because you are a busy man, you're a healthy man, and we appreciate your time in uh, sharing some of your memories and uh, all the very best. And MI Sports Thanks. Facilities, if anyone wants to go over a hit or a shot of basketball. Mark Bradke, what a superstar. And thanks again to the big fella for joining us, uh, Coach. He, he is a legend. And, and, a uh, great great... The court, and a great guy off the court too. And you know what? It really annoys you and me. Uh, he is a off. very good golfer. <laughs> really <laughs> annoys. Hey, Coach, one of the questions I wanted to ask you about uh, the news that continues to filter through that we got a new team in Tasmania. There's this big uh, 
survey, questionnaire, poll going on, asking people to name the new Tasmanian team that will be in uh, next year. They're in the process of employing staff and building a, a team. I want you to put your general manager's hat, hat on. Let's just assume that you've been appointed the new general manager of the Hobart, whoever they are. Right. All right? And, and we take a hypothetical. You can have any player in the NBL competition as we speak. And here's the criteria. You've, you've got to sign them and that you, there's an expectation that you're going to build around this player for the next three years. So you yep. can't take someone at the tail end of their career. Yep. Well, maybe you might want to. You might think of a reason, so I don't want to. But just think of that. Tell me the player that you would pick as the GM of the Tasmanian or Hobart, whoever they are, who would you pick as that player to build the franchise around? Um, I've changed my mind now. I think I'll, I'll go with either. I think I'll go with Gooling or Machado. Probably, I'd probably go with Machado mm-hmm. because of his age. But Gooling, here's a guy who probably, who, yes. who probably didn't get the ball as much as he should have last From year. From Tasmania too? From Tasmania the year yes. before. Mm-hmm. We know he can score with ease. Here's a yep. guy who scored 50 points in a game. I reckon if you put some players around him and give yes. him the ball, I'm taking him 100%. Chris Goulding from Melbourne United. Yeah, and that's a, a good one. It's you got to think of the next three years and, I don't and care. how. Yeah, oh, I agree. He's a, he's a superstar, and because he's a local, you can mark him. There's other things you can do to uh, that that he would bring to the to other things that he would bring to the table. Yeah. If I am the general manager and I'm making my pick, and there's it's it's a real hard one because there's such a a lot of quality players, and I think Scott Machado was an interesting one. I never actually thought of that, but I reckon now that you've mentioned it, that's a very good choice, Coach. And I think I'm on the, the similar line in that I'm going with Bryce Cotton. Now, that sounds like the obvious one because he's a two-time uh, NBL MVP. He's already won three championships with <laughs> Perth Wildcats, right. and he's a star. But one, he's a superstar. Two, the way in which he plays the game. He's exciting. You got this small guy out there running, exciting fans, bring people through the gate. Three, he is a class individual. Yep. Speaks well, carries himself well, high substance sort of guy. And um, for all those things is the reason why I'd be uh, I'd be going with him. That's a good pick, Drew. That is a good pick. You're absolutely well, right. it's one of those ones we're lucky here in Australia. We've got a, a number of choices that um, that we can that, – that would all be really good ones, but it's it's going to be interesting because this is going to happen really quick. Yes. Someone is going to have to be making these decisions really, really quickly uh, in order to get that um, to get that team moving along. Hey, Copes, uh, we always like to finish the show with some little quirky stuff that's going on as well. Did you see uh, a couple of days ago LeBron James? Now, I don't know if you're into sporting memorabilia and cards. Did you? Yeah. You had a couple of NBA cards, didn't you? Probably, yeah, maybe four or five, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, they must have been. That's quick photography work to get you. <laughs> that <laughs> camera. Big on the bit, yo. That yeah. cameraman. Quick, he's on. <laughs> <laughs> they finally got one they can put okay, on the car. Okay, okay, let's go. <laughs> well, LeBron James, he set another record uh, last weekend. A signed upper deck rookie card. What would you, what do you think? You'd pay, or someone would pay, the value of a signed upper deck rookie card of LeBron James. Well, seeing that cards aren't that aren't, aren't in, in value anymore, not that it's, you know, you, you, you don't pay a lot of money for cards yes. anymore like you did back in our day. Yes. You probably think you'd pay 50000 for a card, maybe? Yep. Well, 40, 40, 50 grand, maybe? <laughs> and, well, and I think some rich person that's got more money than cents, I yeah. reckon that'd be about, you reckon that'd be about the ceiling. Yeah. Well, this upper deck rookie card, 2003-2004, sold, get this, $1.845 million. It's the most expensive card ever purchased and the priciest trading card of any kind in the modern era. Which and the is- dumbest owner in life. Who would pay <laughs> $1.84 million for a piece of paper? Are you kidding me? Come on, Drew. My house. I- 
I thought, well, gee whiz, if he is 1.85, what is Leonard Copeland worth? Uh, so yeah. I, I, jumped, I jumped on eBay. Is that and, uh, okay. No, I'm not. Make sure you put your card up there next to mine in here. Don't try to be funny, Drew. All my work. I'm up. <laughs> I, 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 anywhere between 10 to 25 bucks. Actually, I take that back. Anywhere between two to 25 dollars <laughs> is where you're now. That is just that is a bargain if I've ever. If he's worth 1.845 million, surely you got to get a hundred or something. Close. And, and back in the day, we were on Channel 10, it was like that, all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, and hey, I, I'm on this, on the same coast. Mine, a couple of bucks, you pick up an Andrew Gaze one. But here's the thing: we, we, we're accessible. We're man of the people. We're prepared to sign. That's right. You can see me all the time, man. You know, you can get to me anytime you want. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> hey, coach, this has been another. Uh, this has been fun. I've enjoyed my time with you. A uh, lot going on in the free agency period. We're going to we'll, uh, discuss as they, they go. Good luck to all the uh, signing, the new signings and their new teams, and there's still plenty more to come. But um, great times uh, chatting hoops with you, my friend, and uh, I look forward to doing it again with you next week. Well, Joey, when you get yes. some time, come by my house and I'll help you with that golf swing, all right? <laughs> that's, so that's... that golf swing so you can get your hole in one. <laughs> thanks, guys. I really enjoyed it today. It was fun. Uh, it was a good fun, and thanks to the good folk at No Filter Media. They're the people that's bringing all this together, all this Tom Fuller and great fun that we're having together, Coach. No Filter Media, they do a fantastic job. Jump on their socials and all that stuff that the young folk deal with. Uh, you're across that, Coach. I'm not across it like you are, but uh, jump on all those and you can catch us uh, anywhere. Until next week, it is bye for now. This has been a No Filter Media production. Say what you want.